Ellen White wrote about the importance of dwelling upon the life of Christ, especially on the closing scenes of his life. She says it would be beneficial to spend a thoughtful hour every day reviewing, contemplating, imagining his life, especially the closing scenes. The result, she says, will be that our faith is strengthened, our love will be revived, and we will be more deeply filled with the Holy Spirit. That's what I want for me, <laughs> and that's what I want for you. So with that in mind, I've decided to spend the next few uh, sermons that I have with you looking at the closing scenes of Jesus' life on this earth. And it is my wish and prayer that as we do so, we indeed have our faith strengthened and our love revived, and we're indeed filled on a deeper level with the Holy Spirit. So please pray with me again as we begin. Father in heaven, what you've done for us is so amazing, and we just want to meditate on that. We want to review that and, and contemplate that and imagine that over these next few uh, messages. Um, please bless us and guide us today. Um, change my thoughts and my words to be yours, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So, a lot of people begin the closing scenes of Christ's life at that triumphal entry, a week, uh, less than a week before he died, a week before he r was raised from the dead. So just a few days before his crucifixion, Jesus enters Jerusalem triumphantly on a donkey. And that day, massive crowds praised him. They declared that Jesus was indeed the Messiah, and they were ready to crown him king and overthrow the Romans. Jesus was incredibly popular. In fact, in John's account, you find the um, Pharisees are in despair. They're saying, what are we doing? We're accomplishing nothing. The whole world is following him. That's why they were trying to figure out how to get him at night, right? Because they were terrified of the crowds. Here's my question, though. Where were those crowds on Friday? You're talking just a few days later. Where were these enthusiastic fans of Jesus when Pontius Pilate gave them the choice between Barabbas and Jesus? He was going to release Jesus. Where were they? Where were these massive crowds when he was crucified? Turn with me, please, in your Bibles to Mark 14. Mark chapter 14. This morning, I would actually like to look more at the event that happened before uh, the triumphal entry. The night before that event is recorded here in Mark 14. We'll begin reading in verse 3. Mark 14, verse 3, and I am reading from the, new, uh, from the English Standard Version, so it, it reads a little bit different. Mark 14, starting in verse 3. And while he, that's Jesus, was at Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, as he was reclining at table, a woman with an alabaster flask of ointment of pure nard, very costly, and she broke the flask and poured it over his head. There were some who said to themselves indignantly, why was the ointment wasted like that? For this ointment could have been sold for more than 300 denarii and given to the poor. And they scolded her. We'll pause there. Do you have any idea how valuable this ointment was? Mark says that it was very costly, but that is an understatement. We're not going to believe this. So it was spike, spike nerd, probably. And it, it's a, made from a plant that grows in the Himalayas, in the north of India. So it was imported from there. It was used as perfume. It was used as medicine. And Mark says it was worth more than 300 denarii. Now, I know you guys know all about denarii, right? Yesterday, you were at the Burger King buying a Whopper for three denarii. Or you could get the whole meal for five, right? No, probably not. Is that one of those new, like, cryptocurrencies or something? Maybe? No. Denarii, a, a denarius is the singular form, was um, equal to a day's wage for a common laborer. Which means this ointment was worth more than 300 days' wages. 
Now, let's think about this in terms of minimum wage, because this was like a, a common laborer, unskilled, just, just your average laborer. So minimum wage, given a five-day work week, if we calculate this out using federal minimum wage, seven twenty-five an hour, times eight hours per day, times 300 days, $17,400. $17,400. And Mark says it was worth more than 300 denarii. So you're talking this thing's worth far more, I don't know how much more, than $17,000. And she broke the flask. It was gone. It was all gone on Jesus' head and feet. Wow. <laughs> she, this is Mary, according to John's account, walked in during the meal and literally dumped more than $17,000 on Jesus' head and feet. That's why they scolded her. I think we would have been scolding her too. Think about this. I think we would have all been, most of us at least, we would have sided with the disciples. Imagine this with me. Let's just say the social committee is meeting, right? And they're planning a, a church picnic. That would be cool. And someone stands up in the meeting. Let's just say it's a brother. And he says, you know, I just feel this overwhelming gratitude toward this church. And to Jesus for all that he has done. My life has been transformed by the gospel. And I'm so grateful. And, and as a symbol of how grateful I am, at this church picnic, I'm going to put on a fireworks display. I'm going to hire professionals to the tune of $17,000. But that's nothing compared to my gratitude for Jesus. $17,000. Can you imagine that? What would we do? <clears throat> Brother, we appreciate your generosity. Really. Why don't we get some sparklers and remodel the bathrooms or something? <laughs> right? Or think about how much that would go overseas. Let's give that to a mission project. Let's put that in our community service fund so we can help people in need in the community. $17,000. What a waste of resources. Jesus didn't think so. Jesus did not think that was a waste of resources. Let's keep reading. Verse 6. But Jesus said, leave her alone. Why do you trouble her? She has done a beautiful thing to me. Again, this is English Standard Version. It reads, a beautiful thing. For you always have the poor with you. And whenever you want, you can do good for them. But you will not always have me. She has done what she could. She has anointed my body beforehand for burial. And truly I say to you, wherever the gospel is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has been told, done will be told in memory of her. Friends, Jesus wants us to fall in love with him. And people do crazy things when they fall in love. I did not get the story pre-approved for my wife. But when we were first dating, <laughs> when we were first dating, we would talk on the phone late into the night, early into the next morning uh, sometimes. And there were times... <laughs> where we couldn't bear to hang up the phone at the end. We couldn't bear to hit the red button. So we would put our phone on, on speakerphone and leave it by the side of our bed it, it, when we were finally ready to go to sleep. And we would sleep and leave it on there, connected all night long because we couldn't bear to hang up. People do crazy things when they fall in love. Am I right? People do insane things when they fall in love. And I think that's what's happening here. Mary is in love with Jesus. She showed up, she dumped $17,000 on Jesus' head and feet. Why? She loved him. Nothing was too valuable for her to give. It was an act of reckless affection for her Savior, and Jesus loved it. He was delighted. He said it was a beautiful thing. Jesus wants us to fall in love with him. And no, I don't mean that you have to dump $17,000 of anything on anyone. That's not what he wants. He wants your heart. That's a beautiful thing to him. Give him your heart, and when you do, beautiful things will flow from that. When you give him your heart, everything else will automatically come along with it. Your time, your, your money, your resources, your energy, everything. So what about that crowd of people on Sunday? The ones cheering Jesus as he triumphantly entered Jerusalem? Remember our question? Where were they five days later? Where were they when Pontius Pilate gave the choice between Jesus or Barabbas? I believe they were there. 
They were right there. I believe that many of the same people who yelled Hosanna to the son of David also yelled, give us Barabbas. The same people who shouted, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, five days later were shouting, crucify him. The same people that waved palm branches, waved their fists at him as he hung on the cross. They were just following the crowd. They didn't love him. They were following the crowd. Friends, what if we're just following the crowd? What if we're just like those people? What if we're fans of Jesus today when it's easy, but when things get difficult, we turn against him? Jesus wants us to fall in love with him. Jesus wants us to be like Mary. Mary was there. Mary stood by Jesus' feet as he hung on the cross. The, the crowd from the triumphal entry was nowhere to be found. Mary followed Jesus' body to the tomb. The disciples who grumbled about what she had done, nowhere to be found. And on Sunday morning, Simon, who threw the feast for him and then complained about what Mary did, Simon was nowhere to be found, but Mary was the first person Jesus appeared to. She was there because she loved him. She loved him. So what about you? Have you fallen in love with Jesus? Have you given him your heart? Have you done a beautiful thing for Jesus like Mary did? Or are you like the crowd, a fair weather follower? We have soul searching to do. I have soul searching to do about this. Do I follow Jesus when it's easy? Or do I keep following him when it's hard, when, it, when it's not cool, when he's not popular anymore, when it's not fun? What if I was faced with death? Would I still be faithful to Jesus? We have to fall in love with him. That's the only answer. The crowds were convinced. They were sure that Jesus was the Messiah. It's not enough to be convinced. Peter said that he would follow him to the death. He was committed. They were convinced they were committed, but it wasn't enough. Why? Because they didn't love him the way Mary did. Friends, the only way we will be faithful to Jesus is if we have fallen in love with him. An intellectual understanding of the truth and agreeing with the truth will never be enough. It will never be enough. Merely believing that the truth is true is not enough. Merely observing the, the Sabbath is not enough. Understanding Bible prophecy, Daniel, Revelation is not enough. Especially in light of Bible prophecy. Especially in what, what's the light of what's coming. The events of Bible prophecy are unfolding before our very eyes. The end is upon us. Jesus is coming soon. And things are going to get hard. Things are going to get hard. We must be willing to lay down our lives. And the only way we're going to be willing to do that, the only way we're going to be faithful to Jesus when that time comes is if we have fallen in love with him. Martyrs are not willing to die because they're convinced of an idea. Martyrs are willing to die because they're in love with a person. They're in love with Jesus Christ. Let me give you an example. I wholeheartedly believe that George Washington was the first president of the United States. Wholeheartedly, convinced. No question, no doubt in my mind. But what if a terrorist were to, were to test me on that? What if someone were to hold a gun to my head and say, say that George Washington wasn't the first president. Say that it was a guy named Uncle Sam who wore stripes and, and stars on his hat. Say that he was the first president of the United States. Guess what? I'm going to say it. <laughs> I am going to say it. I'm very quickly going to change my mind about George Washington. I'm not going to die for George Washington because I don't love George Washington. I'm convinced. I think he was a great guy. I, I'm sure he was. <laughs> I'm convinced he was a historical figure and he's absolutely real. I'm not going to die for that. <laughs> no way. <laughs> no way. I'm quickly going to rewrite. I'm going to open my mind to the idea. Well, maybe it was Uncle Sam. I don't care. <laughs> I'm not going to die for, for, for something I believe wholeheartedly. I'm not going to die for that. Because I don't love George Washington. <laughs> Friends. We will never be faithful to Jesus in the face of persecution because we're convinced of an idea. We'll only be faithful to Jesus because we love him. In August of 2019, 
Uh, better get their names right. Andre and Jordan Anchondo, Anchondo were planning a party at their home in El Paso, Texas. And they it was a triple celebration. Uh, it was their he had just finished building a house for them. It was completed. They were celebrating that. They're celebrating their wedding anniversary and their their daughter was turning six. So they had this this whole party planned and they stopped at Walmart before to get some supplies. You may remember this was in the news. A shooter came in. It was an act of domestic terrorism. He was the gunman was targeting people that looked Hispanic and they were Hispanic. They were citizens of the United States, but obviously he didn't stop to check that. <laughs> he was shooting anyone that looked Hispanic and he I won't describe exactly what happened, but after the fact, they found they found uh, Andre dead, standing in front of his wife. They found Jordan dead, standing in front of shielding their, their two-year-old. His name was Paul. And baby Paul was not two-year-old, two-month-old, excuse me. Baby Paul holding him, shielding him, cuddling him, finding a way to save him. He was alive. He was fine. He survived because they gave their lives for him. They interviewed, um, you know, their family later, and, and the sister said the obvious that that Paul owes his life to the fact that those that his his mom and dad um, laid down their lives for him. Friends, we owe our lives to Jesus, who laid down our lives for us. Today, I, I want to ask you to fall in love with Him. He's given us His life; give Him yours as well. Fall in love with Jesus. Give him your heart. And that, my friends, when you give him your heart, that is a beautiful thing to him. Amen. And let's uh, sing our closing hymn, Take My Life and Let It Be, number 330. <laughs>